Welcome back to season two of What Your GP Doesn't Tell You, the podcast for both doctors and patients with me, Liz Tucker. Today, I'm talking to Terence Young, who became a drug safety advocate, founding the non-profit Drug Safety Canada, following the tragic death of his 15-year-old daughter, Vanessa, after taking the drug propolicide. Terence argues in his new book, Forbidden Knowledge, a self-advocate's guide to managing your prescription, that most of us have absolutely no idea about the true risks and benefits of the prescription drugs we take. He says that it's essential that we all educate ourselves about prescription drug safety. We can't just leave it to doctors. And the only way we'll find out this information is by asking the right questions. So in this interview, Terence explains the 10 key points or rules we all need to know. For example, were you aware that a patient's individual response to a drug can vary by 400 to 4,000 percent? And find out why, unless there's a very good reason, you should try to avoid taking a drug less than seven years old. Before we get to Terence's interview, a brief request from me. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to find out more, you can sign up to my Substack account, which is Liz Tucker dot substack dot com go to my podcast website at what your gp doesn't tell you dot com and follow me on twitter at liz c tucker and if you'd like to financially support the podcast i'd really appreciate it a huge amount of work goes into both the research and production of this so even a small amount a month makes a huge difference and you can provide support at patreon dot com slash what your gp doesn't tell you or via my website which, as I mentioned, is whatyourgpdoesnttellyou.com. Many thanks. Now back to the interview with Terence. Terence Young is a former Canadian politician and the chair of Drug Safety Canada, which advocates for safer prescription drugs. Here's his interview. So Terence, thank you very much indeed for joining the podcast today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, Terence, your interest in drug safety really started after the tragic death of your daughter after she was put on propolicide. Can you explain what happened? Yes. She had a problem, as a lot of teenage girls do, throwing up after meals. I don't think she ever had full-fledged bulimia because she was not a binge eater and she didn't take uh, laxatives, which are two conditions of having bulimia. Nevertheless, she had the problem. The doctors recommended this drug we never heard of. We had absolutely no warning this drug could be dangerous. And she was on it on and off for months and she thought it was helping her. So we let her stay on. We went to see a gastroenterologist, an expert, and she gave us no safety warning about the drug. Four doctors knew she was on it. None of them gave us a safety warning. So one Saturday we wrote shopping, came home and she came to negotiate her evening's activities which wasn't my favorite time for a 15-year-old girl. I said, talk about it after dinner. She jumped up from a chair she was sitting on in my study, and as if a giant hand stopped her midair, and she crashed to the floor. And I went and felt her carotid artery, and nothing. So this is the beginning of a, a nightmare. Anyone can imagine this nightmare. I called my brother, who's a doctor, and luckily he was home. He said, give her CPR. We did that. A nurse who lived three doors down came to the house and helped. So we had CPR. We had her blood moving in her body, her oxygen uh, going into her blood. And the ambulance first responders came, and they did the same thing. And they said to me, is she on any drugs? I said, no, she's just taking this drug, Prepulsive. That's the only thing. She doesn't have any other drugs. They said, you better go search her room. And I thought, oh, my God. So I was searching through her. There was nothing there. She never did any street drugs. There. And they couldn't get her heart going. Uh, so this was a real night of terror. Finally, they got it going. They thought they had. It was touch and go. Took her to the hospital. So I would chatted with one of the doctors, a heart doctor, on the way out of the hospital because they were putting her in an ambulance to take her to a specialist center in Hamilton, Ontario. And I said, what's this I hear about propulsive? He said, they dish it out like water. I thought, oh, my God. They took her to this emergency center in Hamilton, and uh, she never regained consciousness. She died the next day. I'm so sorry to hear that. Thank you. That was 23 years ago, next month. And that really started your investigation into 
yes. drug safety. What were you able to discover about the drug that she was on? The day after Vanessa died, I got on the internet in the morning and I found the safety warnings that we'd never seen and Vanessa never heard that propulsive could stop people's hearts. In fact, the US government and Johnson & Johnson, the drug's manufacturer, negotiated for five years before the company pulled propolicide. By then, the US government had reports of 80 heart-related deaths and 341 injuries amongst patients taking the drug. It was very hard to get all this information. I spent, it basically took control of my life. We prepared it all. We had it. We had a inquest into Vanessa's death a year later where all this information came out. Back in January 1995, the FDA told the drug's manufacturer, Johnson & Johnson, that without studies showing that the drug worked in children, it wouldn't get approval for paediatric sales. And the company never applied for approval, so the label didn't recommend the drug for children. But the issue is here, doctors are still free to prescribe medicines beyond their recommended use. That's what's known as off-label prescribing. And propolicide became popular amongst paediatricians for infants. One of them was two-year-old Gage Stevens of Pennsylvania, three weeks before Vanessa died. And what happened was the coroners and the doctors said, well, that's SIDS. Well, you know what SIDS is. An infant died and we don't know why. And so they never put it together. So they took it off the market just the day before Vanessa was buried and it was announced. And people were calling, oh, I heard about this drug, etc. But they insisted that it wasn't the drug that caused her death. And Terence, they suggested Vanessa had an undiagnosed heart defect. For which there was zero evidence. And Johnson & Johnson said it removed the drug from the market because physicians continued to prescribe it inappropriately, despite repeated attempts by the company to warn them against that. But Terence, although the drug's been removed from many countries, the latest information suggests it's still being used in some countries, as it appears to be being made by generic drug companies located there, and marketed under a variety of different drug names, which presumably makes it much harder for patients trying to find out information about the drug. Yes. So if a family member got on a computer and looked and said, this drug is, is this drug dangerous? And they put in one of the names, nothing would come up. Propulsive wouldn't come up or the generic name, Sisypra. So drug names are a real problem. So you then took the drug company to court. I think you were involved in legal wrangles for sort of yes. six years or so, and you finally settled out of court. Yes. What happened was there was a, there was a class action out of New Orleans in the United States the lawyers advertised, and there were about 13,000 patients or family members of patients who became part of that class action. And they settled that class action about five years later. And after that, they wanted to come to me because I was the one who was making all the noise in Canada. I was the one who was in the media. They wanted to try and see if they could settle with my, my family and I. And so given the choice, which was I could get my day in court, under civil procedure in Ontario, but if I didn't win, I would have to pay their legal costs. So not only would I have lost my daughter, I would probably lose my home. So it's very seldom that victims in those situations or their families have a chance of getting a fair shake. The costs, as you say, are astronomical. Most lawyers, you you give them a check for $20,000 as a retainer, and that gets eaten eaten up with just you know, four meetings or five meetings or something. So we were very lucky. Gary Will, who was our lawyer here in Oakville, he took on the case because he was passionate about it and he wanted to make a difference. And so he worked for us. This is very rare now for six years without getting paid a cent. This is a story where the, the lawyer's the hero, right? And six years later, we did what we had to do. We settled and we agreed that we have no further claim and it's to our satisfaction. And Johnson & Johnson agreed to pay up to $90 million to settle lawsuits that eventually involved claims that 300 people died and as many as 16,000 were injured from taking propolicide. The company has defended the safety of the drug and said that its marketing was appropriate. And Terence, did you get any response from the company? They gave a sort of half-hearted apology verbally to us at the meeting, but it doesn't really mean much, you know. And it's, it's, nothing changes what happened. But of course, the problem with settling out of court 
when you go to court, it's the one time where you have full disclosure of documents, which can be incredibly valuable. It's incredibly valuable. In fact, uh, Dr. David Healy, who's a psychopharmacologist expert. Yeah, he's, he's been on the podcast, actually. He was able to get information on the record on in a number of cases where the big pharma companies lost to plaintiffs who had suffered from psychiatric drugs, either suicides or whatever. We did get some information from uh, Jansen Ertho that was very, very helpful. Discoveries is how the information comes out. The other side is people who are part of class actions, they have a greater chance of winning because of the publicity. Do you think it helped having a higher public profile? Yes. I was a previous Canadian politician at that time. I later ran for parliament federally. But as a former MPP, people knew me. I was known as a sort of someone who would speak out. Now, this kicks off a wider investigation from your perspective. And I think a lot of people will be surprised to hear that deaths from prescription drugs are the third or fourth leading cause of death, depending on which expert you listen to. And that doesn't mean drug overdoses. That means people taking drugs as prescribed and recommended by their doctors. Yeah. Well, one of the first things I discovered that shocked me and got me more involved, and actually, as I said, it seized control of my life, was what I learned about prescription drugs. I realized that most people have no clue of the real risks when they take prescription drugs. But the numbers you allege in the book are staggering. 2,461 deaths per week in US hospitals, 81 million serious adverse events over the year, 2.7 million hospitalizations. Where do those figures come from? Well, those figures come from studying hospital records. Professor Donald Light did that study with Dr. Joe Election from Canada. And so that's the only place you're going to find the truth. And Terence, the problem appears to be that most possible adverse events are not reported. They give a patient a drug, the patient comes back and said, I had this terrible reaction. I felt my heart fluttering in my chest, which would be a heart arrhythmia. And the doctor says, oh, well, that's not the right drug for you. We'll just give you another drug. But why don't they report these? Before our interview, I looked up what the UK regulator says, which says yeah. that drug adverse reactions must be reported. The American Medical Association says the doctors have a responsibility to report suspected adverse events, which yeah. result from the use of a drug or medical device. Yet, continually, it seems only a fraction of cases are ever reported. So why do you think that is? Well, there are a lot of reasons. And, and first of all, if a doctor gives a drug that harms a patient, they feel terrible. They're generally good people. But by not reporting, they're leaving all the other patients who take that drug at greater risk. So it should be a law. But in, in Canada, every province has its own rules. So in Vanessa's law, the, the, the law that I had passed in Ottawa, we said everybody in hospitals where there's a serious adverse drug reaction, they have to report. And so that passed in 2014, uh, but it was not enacted till basically 2020 before they came up with a regulation that said they should report it. Now, are doctors reporting them? Well, it's been over two years now that we should have reports. I haven't seen any reports from hospitals. Health Canada is very secretive and they're just not talking about it. The reasons they don't, well, they're afraid of being sued is another reason. Another reason they don't report them is because they're hard to identify. A patient comes into the doctor's office and said, I had this tremendous pain in my, my stomach or, or tremendous pain here or there. And, but that could be from something else entirely and the doctor's not sure, so they're reluctant to report. My answer to that is report a suspected adverse drug reaction. Yeah, I think there's a real misunderstanding from doctors on this. If a patient comes in with a severe effect, you don't need to be able to show that it's connected with the drug. The point is you're supposed to report it. Yeah. Another reason they didn't report them in Canada is because at one point, and this is American doctors too, they just feel that nobody's doing anything with them. Well, I met one uh, doctor in the States and he reported 40 adverse drug reactions or 40 times over the years. He never got one response from the regulator, the FDA. So he just stopped. I have doctors make it a rule. They have to report all, all serious adverse drug reactions or suspected ones. Then somebody at Health Canada, if they pay attention, can put them together and contact the drug company and say, we want you to do further testing on this drug. We want you to change the label. Or in some cases, we want you to take this drug off the market, at least temporarily. I don't think that's happening. So what you're saying, Terence, is no one's really tracking deaths and serious effects from prescription drugs. 
And the regulators, whether that's the FDA, Health Canada, MHRA, none of them are doing this. I mean, Health Canada, we have Statistics Canada. They don't keep stats on it. If a doctor, a coroner, is looking for a cause of death, they have five choices as a means of death. Could be suicide, homicide, accidental, undetermined, or natural. Now, by law in Canada, and I think uh, there are a lot of provinces and states that have the same policy. If there is what they call a known adverse drug reaction, that is, if it's generally known, or if it's on a label that lists 200 possible adverse drug reactions, they must classify that death as natural. Okay, I want to be very clear on this. So the patient dies, the doctor determines it was a drug that caused the death, and then they find out, oh yeah, we doctors knew about that. They knew about that adverse drug reaction. And they have to put that that's a natural death on all the legal documents. So just talk me through that again, Terence, because I think most people say, well, hang on a moment. They think it's a drug-related death. Why is the doctor putting down that it's a natural death? Well, I believe they're saying, look, no doctor would, would make a mistake like that. So we're just going to classify when a drug kills a patient, we're going to classify it as natural because you know, everybody knows about that adverse drug reaction. The key point, I think, of your book is that you argue that due to vested interest, that what everyone needs to do as a patient to stay healthy is to educate themselves about drug safety. Because of the way the system works, you simply can't rely on others. It's not your life in their hands. No. People say to me, are you saying to me that I shouldn't trust my doctor when my doctor prescribes a drug for me? And I say to them, Vanessa did. No doctor, I've never heard of a doctor doing that intentionally. It's a mistake. Let me tell uh, your listeners what a, what a drug label is. Some people think it's a little thing, a little plastic body, you go with the pills. No, a drug label is a legal document. It's the official prescribing information the drug company gives to the regulators, the FDA and Health Canada, to get the drug approved to sell. And so patients are, are not, not even told there is such a thing. And they'll be able to look up themselves what they found in the clinical trials, and what reports have come to the regulator since about that drug. And if they don't understand any of the words, they can look them up or they can go to a pharmacist or doctor and say, what is this word? What does that word mean? It's a very serious matter. And I recommend it to patients because you're your best advocate. But of course, even if people do go to that drug data, one of the issues is that the pharmaceutical industry have argued that much clinical trial data is proprietary data which is confidential business information. So actually, even the drug regulators don't get to see much of this data. No. If you're a drug reviewer at the FDA or Health Canada, you get the equivalent of about 40 boxes of papers in digital form. You only get so many days to say yes or no, or yes with some conditions, perhaps. And so that's a lot of pressure to put on an individual. And The amount of information is overwhelming, but it's also confusing. It's very, very important to notice the level of evidence that a drug works is so low. And so all they have to do to show that the drug works, slightly better than nothing, which is a placebo. This is a very, very low standard. But that's all they have to prove. They have a business right. They have a commercial right to sell that drug. And if that drug is to treat a disease that a lot of people have, you're looking at potentially a multi-billion dollar seller. In fact, there's a large group of drugs, antidepressants on the market that maybe up to 40 million people in North America take that generally are only proven to work slightly better than placebo. But what, what, what really upsets me is when I found out that the sexual side effects, if you look at the warnings, they're very poor. But you're looking at a 50-page document of eight-point print, and there's two words that say sexual problems. You might never enjoy sex again is the reality. You might not be able to physically. But here's the thing that really upset me. It turns out that for some patients, this is continuing. And continuing is a pharmacy word for doesn't go away. It's the rest of your life. Because I think there's a misunderstanding with exactly what trials are measuring. Because whether a trial spots a side effect on a drug depends whether the trial is actually measuring that side effect. If they're not measuring that side effect, they're not going to spot it. No, and and there could be thousands. And some are minor and not very hard to notice. 
and then some can on the opposite end of the spectrum, some can be quite dangerous. For example, the, um, the suicides uh, that occur from akathisia, which is this severe restlessness some people get from antidepressants. And of course, if you get better while you're on the drug, you don't know if you might have got better anyway, or if it's a drug. Exactly. About 30% of conditions people see doctors for go away on their own. It could have been you know, a minor condition or you ate something that upset your stomach, a whole range of things. And so if your doctor gives you a brand new drug, there was a drug rep in their office that morning who said, this is the best new drug we've had in ages. Give it to patients with these symptoms. So if the doctor gives you that brand new drug, you feel better. When someone went a white coat that, that you really like, they're a really good person, with a stethoscope around their neck says, here, take this, it's going to make you feel better. A lot of people will. They found that certain colors of pills work better for different conditions. For instance, blue pills help you sleep better than red pills. Red pills are better for pain than green pills. So there's a lot of psychological manifestations when people take medicines. And I think the size of the pill can have an impact as well. Of course, yeah. I mean, I think one of the reasons that doctors don't always report side effects is partly, of course, there's, as you mentioned, the issues of being bad, being sued. But you don't want to believe that a drug that you've given a patient has done them harm. Yeah, they feel terrible. Uh, and, and, and they're not sure. And then they send it off to the regulator and they get no response. And they just finally, they just finally give up. But is there also sort of disbelief? Because if the data you've received suggests that this drug is safe, seems to have minimal side effects, Therefore, when your patient says, oh, I'm experiencing these problems, who do they believe? Of course. Yeah. 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 So, Terence, your ideal model is that doctors sit down with the patient and before they prescribe a drug, they clearly spend time running through the various side effects. And I suppose the problem is, I mean, here in the UK, your average GP appointment is 10 minutes. Yes. I could see if a doctor did that, they could easily spend 10 minutes just running through the side effects and risks of the drug. So my answer to that is, so what? Do it. You're putting a patient at risk. They have a right to inform consent. And no one, no doctor would operate on a patient without getting to, to show, demonstrated in writing, conformed consent for surgery. But they do it with drugs that can be quite damaging. They do it all the time. And they have no right to take that decision from the patients. So you argue that to be an informed patient, there are basically 10 rules that everyone needs to know. The first is that all drugs cause adverse events. One of the things I think people will be surprised is that one in five drugs approved in North America eventually get what's called a black box warning. Yes, that's the historical statistics. So they put out a drug, they get it approved by the regulator, and it goes on the market. And within two years, that drug's going to have the highest level of safety warning put on it because it harmed patients, or it's going to be pulled off the market altogether. This is a very interesting point. I, I'd like to tell your listeners about this because the title of my book is Forbidden Knowledge. There's things we're not supposed, patients aren't supposed to know. And they hide things from patients. And this is the one that I, it upset me when I first heard about it, especially after having uh, lost a daughter. When they do clinical trials on prescription drugs to get them approved, there are three levels. Stage four of clinical trials is putting it on the open market. So any patient who takes a drug, a new drug that's on the market, is unwittingly becoming part of a giant drug trial, like a canary in a mine. No one tells patients this. They never stop and say, by the way, would you like to join phase four of a big pharma drug trial? No, well, they would never ask them. They just give them the drug, and the whole world is waiting to see what happens in stage four, which is where it goes to thousands and thousands of patients with thousands of conditions. No one tells patients that, and I think they should have to. I think that's an unethical practice. A patient should have the right to inform consent that they're part of a giant drug trial. And the other point is, if it's a relatively rare side effect, it's not until it goes to a wider population that that becomes apparent. Because if it's a rare side effect that happens, say, in one in 10,000, you'll need at least 30,000 people to be able to start to spot yeah. that. Yeah, they call it the rule of three. If you're going to spot a rare side effect, you can't just give it to 10,000 patients. You've got to give it to 30,000. 
So guess what? It goes to everybody. It's on the open market with no warning. Oh, by the way, all the advertising, the drug companies have, et cetera. Nobody says, join our drug trial. And rule two is know the rare but serious adverse effects before taking a drug, because in practice, the majority of drug side effects are never reported. Exactly. So there could be many, many different uh, effects from a drug. I don't want readers to think only the new drugs cause serious side effects because there are some drugs that are on the market for decades causing adverse effects. And I have never seen a situation where a drug company admits our drug caused this death, our drug caused this this disability. What they always say is all drugs cause adverse effects and we're not sure, but we're going to settle legally with the, with the uh, plaintiffs anyway. So I have 21 questions. I know it's a lot of questions. I suggest that patients ask a doctor before they take a new drug. One of them said, you know, I've heard doctor about the common side effects of this drug. What are the rare but serious ones? And a lot of doctors were stopping their tracks. But is there a problem of data overload? Because let's say there's 40 to 60 pages of information about a single drug. A doctor may potentially prescribe thousands of drugs. Is it actually feasible for them to read every page of that documentation? A standard, a professional standard for doctors is to not prescribe any drug unless they believe it to be safe enough for the patient to take. And and the reason I use the term safe enough is because safe doesn't mean safe necessarily. It means safe enough if the right patient takes it at the right time, if they're not on any other drugs, if they're not on any other, any foods that might be contraindicated, then it's safe enough to take. But so many drugs that the FDA and Health Canada have told patients are safe ended up causing serious reactions and even deaths. Which sort of brings us on to your rule three, which is make sure the potential benefits of a drug outweigh its risks. That's like, I think, the most important rule of taking prescription drugs. Since they all cause adverse effects, and some of them aren't effective, you have to get an answer to both. How likely is it that this drug will help me? So ask your doctor. And how likely is it that I will have a rare adverse effect? But, you know, there are other things you can do. The drug companies will find in their clinical trials the amount of the drug to take to produce the therapy they want, to to be effective for patients. So they will sometimes market drugs in a higher dose than they need to. I mean, if you, you look, when you go buy a pill, all pills are the same size, regardless of the age of the patient or the size of the patient or anything else. So since they're marketing them at a dose that's more than necessary, if you're starting a new drug, ask your doctor, if I take half a dose first to see how it works for me, would that be wise? And a lot of times the doctors will say yes. Which is your rule four, really. The only difference between a drug and a poison is the dose. It's very important to know. One of the most common pharma-speak terms that doctors use, they might say to you, oh, that, that drug has a narrow therapeutic index. That means the difference between the dose that can help you and the dose that can hurt you is very little. Now, people pop aspirin or Tylenol, and sometimes they feel, oh, I think I'll take three this time or two this time, whatever. I tell me, don't, don't ever do that with prescription drugs because the difference between what helps you and what hurts you might only be one more pill. You're taking a double the recommended dose, and that can be very dangerous. So people have to understand that the dose is key. Don't ever do that. I suppose another key thing to ask is the diseases for which the drug has been approved, the difference between something being off-label or not. But if a drug is off-label, we won't have the same data that it works effectively for that disease. Yes, uh, off-label prescribing is very common. So I I think that's a pharmaceutical term patients have to know. Off-label means that it's never been tested for this use. If a doctor has a patient and nothing else can help this patient, and the patient is very distraught, but I think they should tell them, okay, this is an off-label use. It's never been proven for this use, but other doctors have tried it, and they're getting success with this use of the drug. Patients will often say yes, maybe they'll say no, but they have a right to know this is an off-label, which means unapproved uses for a drug because unapproved uses are naturally a little more risky. I mean, I am surprised when I look at the figures that for some drugs, I did a podcast on a drug called Neurontin a while back, and the off-label use was far greater. Well, 
Doctors talk amongst each other. They have patients who have problems that they have difficulty resolving. In fact, the drug that killed our Vanessa, that was an off-label prescription, and it wasn't safe for teenage girls. It wasn't safe for infants either. That was another off-label use. So off-label use can be quite dangerous. The patient has a right to, to make informed consent. If Vanessa's doctor had called us in and said, look, I want to prescribe this drug. It's off-label. We would have never said, yes, give it to her. Never. Her condition wasn't near serious enough to take a drug that could stop her heart. It's a question you should ask a doctor. And rule five is never increase a dose without a doctor's approval and never stop a drug cold turkey. There are many drugs that if you take too many, it's dangerous. You just don't know what will happen. It's not worth the risk. And you can't just stop cold turkey. Stopping cold turkey can be dangerous with a number of drugs. Don't do it. Ask your doctor. In fact, people trying to get off antidepressants who feel terrible when they stop them, there are groups that will help them and show them how to do it. You have to titrate the drug. That is, certain pharmacies will make you pills, the same drug, but with a tiny bit less in, in each pill that you go slowly down over months to avoid those serious, with, they're basically withdrawal effects. And rule six is never take a drug contraindicated with another drug or food. Yeah. If I had to give patients one word to never forget, the most important word in drug safety, it's contraindicated. It means you never, never mix this drug with a drug it's contraindicated with because you could have a serious adverse drug reaction. In fact, in some cases, it could stop your heart or even kill you. So it's also true with some foods. So you have to check with your doctor. Are there any foods that could affect how this drug works? One of them is grapefruit juice. A lot of hospitals, they've banned grapefruit juice for that reason. It interacts with so many other drugs. And let me tell you how serious this is. The drug that caused Vanessa's death, the brand name's Propulsive, uh, after she died, I went to the, the library at the University of Toronto, Pharmacology Library, and they found it was contraindicated with 100 other drugs or foods, 100. The number is now, 23 years later, 23 years later 400 or 500. I think it's near 500. The more drugs you take, the greater the risk of complication. Of course. You can't calculate it. In Ontario now, uh, the average patient in the long-term care facility is on five prescription drugs. I would think that's a, that's a red line because a lot of the patients up in their 80s are on 10 prescription drugs. It's hard to even calculate the potential number of serious reactions you could get from mixing those drugs. And yet it is common. I think once you go over three drugs, actually, that's when you start to see a real increase in risk. Yes. Being that lots of drugs have unknown adverse effects, you multiply the potential risk. So presumably it's worth having a regular medication review with your doctor to see if you need to be taking all the drugs you're prescribed. Yes. In fact, there's a group of women doctors in Quebec and Ontario that are developing and, and have been working on a program called de-prescribing. The fact, what happens in medical schools, doctors are taught to prescribe drugs and what to prescribe them for, but they're not taught how to de-prescribe drugs. So if they go into a long-term care facility, it's the first time they see a patient and the patient's on seven or eight drugs, the best gerontologist will sit down and say, wait a second, let's go through everything you're taking here and tell me why you're taking it. In a lot of cases, the patient won't even remember while they're taking this. Okay. Well, I don't think you need this. We're going to take this one out. And so they can go to a patient who's been over-medicated and over-prescribed on 10 drugs and take away, sometimes they can take, take away three, four, five, or maybe eight, or maybe more. So de-prescribing is something that you can ask your doctor for, or you can find a doctor to do if you think you're taking too many drugs. And rule seven, drugs in the same class work in very similar ways, but not always. Can you give an example of that? Yes. Statin drugs, those are the drugs that millions of people take to lower their cholesterol. And they all work in generally the same way. And they actually do lower cholesterol. They do that. When you get your statin, they, the doctor will look at you seriously and say, now you have to do exercise at the same time. So if your cholesterol goes down, you don't know if it was the drug or the exercise that did it. I've known so many people that lower their cholesterol safely with regular exercise, like walking. But there was one statin that was taken off the market years ago for harming patients, killing patients, actually called Bacol. And so it's in the same group of drugs and it works in a similar way. 
but it was deadly enough to take off the market. So if you're on a class of drugs and you have a reaction or you feel badly, the doctor says, oh, wait, we'll just try this other one. You want to say, wait a sec, I want to check the safety record of that one first, because it's the same class, but maybe it's not quite as safe. They, ha- they work in similar ways. They cause similar adverse effects, but not always. One of the stats I was really surprised about in the book was that a patient's individual response to a drug can vary between 400 and 4,000 percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? It's absolutely amazing. So you might have a 90, 90 year old lady who is a 80 year old lady who's taking a certain drug and uh, the dose is, is uh, not strong enough for her because of the way her she digests drugs, et cetera. And a 200 pound truck driver, two's too many. So you can't assume it's right. Ask your doctor, you always want to get the lowest effective dose of a drug and be well aware of the rare and dangerous side effects that you might be taking on. And rule eight, when taking a new drug, monitor symptoms carefully. Yeah, so many people go to their doctor. I mean, we're conditioned, uh, the advertising and the promotion, is, we're, t- we're conditioned to want a pill for every ill. So you have, you're on a drug, a new drug for you, and uh, you don't even think necessarily that this drug might be causing this new symptom that I have, but you should. So you, you ask your doctor. I recommend to my readers, assume when you have a new system that it might be the drug. And ask your doctor. The doctor might pull out the label, the official label, and find, oh, yeah, here it is. Yeah, that could be causing that. Let's try something else. What's worse is it's a thing called cascading. So what happens is a patient is on one drug, and that one drug is causing an adverse effect. Well, they don't know it's a drug effect. They think, oh, I've got a new medical condition. So they go to the doctor, goes, oh, you've got a new medical condition. So the doctor puts them on another drug. Well, that drug leads to a new side effect. The doctor thinks that's a new medical condition. Before you know it, you've got a patient on five or six drugs and all the risks of them interacting and causing sleep disturbance and all the other stuff, when really it all came from one drug at the very beginning. Was that drug really necessary? So you got to go back to the beginning and say, I'm on all these drugs. Are they necessary? Are they helping or hurting? And there's a real lack of data about how drugs interact with each other. Yeah, because you have to get it from patients. I mean, you don't want to start mixing drugs on patients in a, some kind of clinical trial because it'd be unethical, because they could easily be harmed. This is another reason doctors should be reporting all adverse drug reactions and suspected interreactions. And also, weirdly, a drug which has a bad side effect might actually be clinically useful yes. for other patients in a new trial if we knew about it. Yes. Yeah. So that's a very good point. Actually, one doctor I talked to one time said to me, look, when you have a new drug, you're testing drugs, all you have is effects. They're not necessarily good effects or bad effects. They're just effects. And all drugs have thousands of effects. So you might not notice them at all, and you might not be able to identify them. But something that people call the side effect before turns out to be a whole brand new drug. And I'll give you an example. The drug Viagra, and everybody knows what that's used for, that was a heart drug that didn't work very well. And they noticed this side effects amongst some of the patients, the men. And the side effects was what they sell it for now. Men were getting erections. And so all of a sudden, they realized they had a new blockbuster on their hands. And rule nine, unless you absolutely have to, don't take a drug that's newer than seven years. And that's presumably because there'll be better safety data about a drug later on. It's after seven years on the market, because so many people have taken it, usually, if it's a widely sold drug, it will have an established safety profile. You're much less likely to suffer an adverse drug reaction from a drug that's been on the market seven years and used widely than from one that's new. And I think for some people that's a bit counterintuitive because if their doctor says, oh, we've got this new drug, it looks incredibly successful, there's a sort of thought that a new drug will be better than an old one, but that's not necessarily the case. No, it, no. we tend to think that because when you go and buy a new car, if you buy a new car every four years, what's well, going to be way better, it's better technology and it's going to be safer, et cetera. Same with you know, cell phones and cameras and stuff. So we assume new drugs in the market are better than the older drugs. No, they don't have to prove prove that their new drug is better than the best-selling existing drug in the market for your condition. They only have to prove it's better than nothing, which is placebo. So you can't assume that it's better. I, I, I really want to make sure patients understand that because newer drugs have newer 
adverse reactions. You're better with one a drug with an established safety profile. You'd imagine the obvious thing would be to test the new drug against the best current available treatment. Yeah, well, they do it sometimes, but it's rare. There have been studies that shown the drug companies they advertise spend they spend six billion dollars a year in North America uh, advertising their prescription drugs. In the states, it's legal to do that, and it's proven that the drugs that aren't very effective, those are the ones they advertise the most. And Terence, do you think there's another issue because to get a drug approved, you have to have two positive trials, but you could have ninety eight negative trials. But as long as you've got the two positive ones, yeah. Any researcher who signs a contract with a drug company uh, to do research on their drug, that contract will say, gives the drug company the right to stop the trial at any point. So there is a movement, it's coming along well in Europe, et cetera, that any drug trial that is started must be registered, including what you're trying to show, and that if it's stopped, that the partial data has to be published. They hire a researcher, the researcher comes back, with the partial results midway through the trial, and it's not showing the drug works, thanks very much, stop the trial. And then finally, they do a trial on the drug. And some researcher, presumably using a different methodology, is able to show, yes, the drug actually works better than placebo. That's the one that gets published. It's called publication bias. And your final rule that patients should remember, which is rule 10, don't take a drug that doesn't work or isn't needed. And an interesting example you quote is the drug for female desire. Yes, Adeni. People make decisions to take prescription drugs emotionally. I mean, that's what the TV commercials do. They take advantage of the viewers and the listeners and the magazines too, to say these wonderful things about a drug. So this drug, Adyi, it was actually turned down for approval twice by the FDA. (laughs) Yes. So this was a drug... It was an antidepressant that didn't work very well. So this tiny company bought the drug to develop it and market it. They sold it as a female Viagra. And I don't know anybody who says that the uh, Viagra and that group of drugs doesn't work for men. They're an effective drug. They do what they're supposed to do. And the trials for Adji showed the best benefit they could get was less than one additional sex act a month. They said, do not take Adji with alcohol. Well, as if sex and alcohol never go together, right? Uh, Because it could cause patients to faint or otherwise be at risk. That was the best result they could get for it. So the FDA said no. And the the adverse reactions from the drug was it could make the the women that took it sleepy. uh, It could make them dizzy. It could make them feel sick to their stomach, not sexy. So the FDA turned it down twice. And then they created, the drug company created their own patient group. And they had them advocate before the FDA and in in the media, if men have Viagra, women should have Adi. So they turned it into a political issue. Well, you shouldn't be approving a drug because of this political action committee, this patient group that the company actually assembled itself. It's called called an AstroTurf organization. So then the FDA approved it. So the company that developed the drug under the name Adji and got it approved within a very short period of time, sold it to another drug company for a billion dollars. So that would have been a massive profit just for getting the FDA to approve a drug. So when you're investigating a new drug, you got to do a little bit of your own research. Sometimes you just go to Google, you type in the name of the drug and put side effects and you can get the safety profile. If you think there's a serious risk, type in the name of the drug and type in lawsuits. And you'll find that some of the law firms provide better safety information on the drugs than you can get from any medical organization. So I guess therefore, at root of all of this, you really want to have a strong collaborative relationship with your doctor so that you can discuss these things openly and honestly and basically have proper informed consent. Yeah, so by the way, if you don't have a doctor that you go to regularly, try to find one. Sometimes it's hard, there's shortage in some places. That doctor gets to know your health profile. They have your health records. They can give you better informed advice on what drugs might be useful for you or whatever. But I I say it all happens in that little room with your doctor where you have to be as honest as you can with doctors. Now, be honest with your doctor. It's hard sometimes because you want your privacy, but they have to ask you a lot of personal questions. If you answer them honestly, 
you're going to get better treatments and you're going to probably end up with better health care. But I also said, politely challenge your doctor, say, I just read this book and I've decided I only want to take drugs that are for sure going to be effective for me from now on and for sure are going to be as safe as possible for me from now on. So do you mind if I come to my appointments and bring a list of questions to ask you? Sometimes you, you might want to consider taking somebody with you, a trusted relative or friend. They can remind you what questions you wanted to ask the doctor and they can help because if it's somebody you live with and you take a, have a psychiatric drug, they might notice a symptom that you have before you do. Or if you take a drug that caused you to faint, they might come home one day and find you on the floor and they want to check what medication you're on right away. So it's very good to have good communication with your doctor. Really collaborate. I don't bash doctors. I, I say you want to work with a doctor. Don't start diagnosing yourself uh, because that's not safe either. And that view is what we need to do to improve drug safety in the future. Yes. I have a section in the back of the book where I talk about reforms that are needed in government and, and in medicine, major reforms. I don't have a lot of faith they're going to happen quickly. In the shorter term, dealing with your doctor and knowing where to find good information and knowing what to do about it and how to handle it, that is going to make you uh, safer and probably healthier. Well, Terence, thank you so much indeed for talking today. Really important information. Thank you. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Because you made the interview so easy. Not at all. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. Have a good weekend. Cheer Bye. Bye. Hope you enjoyed the latest episode of the podcast. In the next episode, I'm talking to Dr. John Abramson, a leading expert on statins, to discuss what the data on these drugs actually tells us and to answer the question, should you take a statin or not? So do join me again. And a reminder, you can follow me on Twitter at Liz C. Tucker and sign up to the podcast mailing list at whatyourgpdoesnttellyou.com. Many thanks for listening. Bye for now.